Hello everyone, um, good afternoon and welcome to another of TTA summer sessions. Today we're joined by Mandy Singh Nawal and his session is going to be on From Teaching to Tutoring, A Guide to Making the Transition. So I'll pass over to Mandy now and he can get started. Thank you, Julius, and a huge welcome and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining this session. I'm super excited to be sharing my journey so far in the transition, uh, my experiences, answering any questions that I might be able to help with with regards to your current situations and sharing any general hints and tips that I might have um, as I've accumulated over the past two, three years. So super quickly, just before we get into things, um, I've had a chance to speak to yourselves, uh, Susan and Daniela. Uh, Belinda, if you're there, it'd be really good to um, hear about your situation just so I can get a bit of a background for each of you and tailor things accordingly. Um, however, if not, that's absolutely fine or just feel free to leave a message in the chat. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was throughout the conversation, um, the key word there is conversation and I'd really appreciate and um, encourage you all to join in at any point with any questions or even things that you feel would be helpful to share to the rest of the group um, throughout. And if there's any general questions at the end, then we'll have time for that as well. And I'll leave my email with you all if you want to continue any session, any questions going forward further. Um, hopefully that sounds okay with everyone. So without further ado, who am I and what am I here to do? So uh, a cheesy picture of myself, um, which I thought would be nice to share, but a little bit about my background. So uh, as mentioned, my name is Mandeep Singh. Um, I've, I'm a qualified maths teacher and I've spent the past five years in an independent school in Birmingham called King Edwards. Um, I come from a mathematical uh, background with a degree from Birmingham University and I was trained under the King Edwards Consortium via a skit route. So after university, I took a gap year to travel for a little bit. I went straight into teaching um, training and then straight into the job. Uh, quite a nice um, affluent independent school in Birmingham where I had an amazing and wonderful time. So I guess the biggest question is why would someone potentially want to tr make the transition from teaching and going to tutoring? And I think there are maybe four or five key reasons why many of us have either thought it or are currently thinking it. And I guess the new thing, uh, one of the things for many people is just a different type of a challenge, uh, a different environment, a different field, but still related to your area of expertise, which is education within your subject of, um, of teaching. If we be quite frank as well, quite often the reason people think about tutoring and leaving the teaching profession, unfortunately, is because of pay and the situation within schools, not just within the UK, but across the world at the moment. Um, and I think that's something that we need to appreciate and there's nothing wrong in that. I think it's absolutely fine because we all want a, a good life and we all want a balanced life. And all of us come into teaching to try and help others, but if we can't help ourselves, then everyone ends up suffering in some way, shape or form. So I don't think there's any harm or any anything wrong with accepting the fact that we want a bit more money in our pockets, which is why a lot of people come into tutoring or take it on as a second job. On top of that work-life balance, again, in some schools and some situations, things can be very stressful. There's a lot of pressure put on teachers and to try and ease that up and enjoy the balance, whether that's with family, other commitments within your community, a lot of people think tutoring might allow them for that balance. And I'll talk about my personal situation in a second, and hopefully that might help to direct your current your current questions as well. Another thing that I didn't realize actually, and I thought tutoring was quite limited, was that it gives us the opportunity to branch into so many different skills. Again, things I'll touch on later on, things like consultancy and even being an advisory in an with an educational background. Um, and these are things that I'm starting to delve into and are things that initially I never even thought would be, uh, I'd have the opportunity to do as a tutor. And I think many of us coming from the teaching world thinking, I'm just gonna tutor kids. I'm just gonna tutor in my subject and that's the glass ceiling. However, as we're starting to find out, tutoring is expanding at an exponential rate, not just within um, England, but across the world. And I myself, I'm very fortunate to have quite a few clients from all across the globe, um, a lot in Asia, a lot in Europe, and a lot in America as well. So I can definitely hone into my experiences with them and what people in other countries are feeling. But the general feeling from me is that tutoring is not going anywhere anytime soon, and it's definitely on the rise. In terms of market cap, there have been quite large sums of figures been thrown around, especially within the UK, within the billions. It's quite hard to capture at the moment, but we definitely know there's serious demand for it. And we're seeing an emergence of 
some very interesting developments. One thing I found out last year at the annual tutors conference, by the way, they haven't paid me to say that, <laughs> but is this idea of online schooling and how teachers could potentially transition into a slightly different setup of a school and enjoy that work-life balance a lot more. And also we've had the Labour government come in now who are threatening, and I believe it's some way, shape or form, it's, 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 uh, it's on its way in terms of the tax implications for private schools. And as a result, we're seeing people that would generally have a little bit more money than your average family um, that would normally put their students into private schools now thinking about a state school option and therefore having a surplus with regards to the money they've saved in the independent school fees. And I've already seen a wave of students come in that have made that transition and now thinking to supplement um, their learning within a state school by private tutors. So in that sense, if things go the way they're looking, there will be a lot of parents that have made that transition but are looking for extra help, which is meaning a lot more work for tutors as well. So I have spoke to a few of you already and you've mentioned, is this feasible? And I'll explain my situation and how I ran a feasibility test, if you like. And if you're interested, I can even show you my spreadsheets and give you a quick insight as to how you can run some very simple calculations to figure out whether this works or not. Um, and I think a few of the things, a few of the factors you need to look at with regards to is it feasible is what kind of clientele do you have and where in your tutoring journey are you? If you have just been teaching so far and you've never done any private tutoring, your feasibility test will be very different to someone that's been tutoring for five years and has maybe 10, 20 clients already. The other thing is what kind of an hourly rate and what kind of a charge are you going to be putting on your service? And that obviously will severely impact whether or not this is feasible for you. And again, I'm happy to give a demo run if people think it might be helpful. So just leave me a message in the chat or a thumbs up and I can I can literally take you through my spreadsheet as to how I made this decision. Um, things to consider myself and Julius were talking a minute ago about peaks and slow periods. And generally what I've found is there'll always be a peak kind of start of the year as we edge in towards Christmas and then things really ramp up as we get to Easter with exam preparation taking place. And Traditionally, people would assume a slow period within the summer. And as I was just mentioning to Julius, I'm actually seeing quite the opposite. A lot of students that haven't done as well as they would have liked to in the end of your exams or potentially have resets coming in November or September are now getting in touch. So I think the culture around tutoring has, has dramatically changed from five, 10 years ago where people were thinking, if someone needs help, I get a tutor. And in particular, with a lot of the clients that I have who are quite affluent, um, are at some of the best schools in the UK and are kind of in that top 10, 15% bracket in terms of wealth. More so, it's our students are and our sons and daughters are doing very well. We want to make sure that it stays at that level. So even though the school might be providing everything they need, they don't want to take a risk and they want to ensure the maximum potential. So there's quite a, a difference with regards to why people are getting involved in tutoring now. Um, and as a result, you're seeing, I'm seeing a lot more consistency throughout the year. Another thing that was a huge decider for me is getting involved with agencies. And I think a lot of tutors initially try and find out everything by themselves and maneuver this field by themselves. And arguably the thing that allowed me to make the jump was getting involved with an agency. And the agency I got involved with was Keystone Tutors that are based in central London. They're an amazing company to work with. I still work with them as a, as a contractor. And that allowed me to have some form of a stable income or some form of a guaranteed access to clients without worrying about my word, my name getting spread amongst previous students. And it just gave me a bit more of a slight guarantee that I'll have a chance to get more clients rather than trying to fend for myself, advertise and all of those things. Would people be interested in a, in a quick demo run with regards to the figures? Otherwise, I can I can move on if people are. OK, yes. yes OK, cool. So I use um, I'm going to hopefully Judith, can you see that? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is my income tracker. Um, obviously, I'm not showing you the current income, but this is a blank sheet. And what I did was I thought about my current salary that I was earning at school, um, which was ranging which was ranging around thirty thousand pound after 
It was about £35,000 after I'd taught at five, for five years at an independent school. Um, and I was generally quite comfortable with it. I live at home with parents. Um, so my financial situation is a little bit different. Then I had been tutoring at that point for around eight years. Uh, I started tutoring when I was in university. So I already had a general clientele built, built up. And as of that, my hourly rate was between 30 to 50 pounds so if we just take 40 pounds for average um, so the way i thought about it was to create a minimum income for example if that's two thousand pound before tax i need to reverse engineer my calculations to be able to think how many hours do i need to tutor per week and how many clients would that translate to so i'm just going to get my calculator out uh, and run the figures so if i'm looking for two thousand pound a month and i'm averaging a 40 pound hourly rate then i need 50 hours of tutoring throughout the week so in that basis i would need if i'm doing five days that would be looking at 10 hours every week sorry not every week uh, my maths is not working divide that by four 50 hours per week i'll write it down here 50 hours per month which would basically be 12.5 hours per week. So then here you can start, and if you already have existing clients, you can start tracking your income over a two, three month period using something like this. And on average, see what am I currently earning and what would the trajectory potentially look like? So if we're looking for 50 hours a month, 12 and a half hours a week, that if you're doing one hour a week with a student is basically 12 students you'd need for the bare minimum at 40 pounds an hour. and you can therefore think about okay do i have six students at the moment do i have 10 and how hard would it be for me to get the extra two three or if you're starting from fresh how realistic is it for you to go from zero to 12 within an instant and what i'd recommend actually is a transitional period which i'll talk about in a, in a little while but hopefully that just gives you an idea as to how i reverse engineered in terms of financially thinking about whether this was feasible or not for me now i was quite overwhelmed and once for myself due to being a math teacher and having um the network that i do as experience grows as um you develop within your own work you can actually start high charging higher rates so i managed to climb the rate the right uh, the rate up as as we went on and that meant less hours but then my demands changed i had a daughter so then i needed a higher income and my wife stopped working um five days she's now down to three days so you can basically keep an eye on the financials yourself but hopefully that gives you a very quick insight as to how to reverse engineer things and how things might be looking and what i'd really recommend is if you're currently tutoring start filling out an income tracker um for the for the past three four months the more data you get the better and if you can go through a year that would be amazing as well but that will just give you some hard data as to what has happened in the past year and can i rely on this hopefully that makes sense so far um, it'd be great to take any questions that people have specifically about the feasibility test in terms of financials right now. Otherwise, um, you can ask at the end. Okay, we'll talk about agencies in a second as well, because that's a very important point. Um, so if that's all for the test run, agencies are very important. It depends on which agency you go for. And I would say 60%, 70% of agencies are basically a free-for-all they take on a lot of tutors um and they have a lot of tutors on their books and then one job will get posted on tutor cruncher and then it just goes into a wall where there's 15 20 people applying for one job um eleni i think that, those are the kind of agencies you're referring to um and i found that they really weren't helpful and it was it was a needle in a haystack to try and find tutor clients from those agencies what i would say is to try and find a bit more of a tailored agency. Agency. So for me, Keystone Tutors, I'll show you their website. Um, again, they are very selective in who they, they take. And my personal journey, I was very blessed to be at a school, an independent school. Um, so this is Keystone Tutors. I'm sure they won't mind me um, praising them. But this is Keystone Tutors, and they work out of central London. I was lucky enough to get a job with these and work with them because of my experience. and. A lot of these higher end tutoring agencies are looking for very specific things where possible. They're looking for experience in grammar schools or independent schools. Um, but in particular, they're looking for strong academic backgrounds. So a good university degree, good reviews and references from parents or clients. And more importantly, 
experience in the curriculums and syllabus or syllabi that students that their clients are from will have access to in particular that's the international exam boards so i know there's a few mathematicians on here that's the igcse exam board for edexcel it's probably 80 percent of what all the top independent uk schools will do and the grammar schools will do and also any international school will do that the other 20 percent is probably the cambridge international ex um, qualification but mainly the igcse from edexcel for other subjects you have similar ones as well but anything with regards to an in, in um, international qualification will if you have experience in that that will be much more favorable to them and just to give you an insight if you're teaching any maths qualification at gcse as a as a, a standard teacher the jump to igcse is not big however a lot of teachers kind of get scared to say i don't want to be i don't want to say that i can teach that because i've never taught it before if you look at the specifications there's two or three topics that are, are different and the only difference is with the in, international qualification is that you can use a calculator for both papers so i would argue that most ma good math teachers at gcse level could very easily teach igcse as well however we just don't sell ourselves to be able to do that the other thing that's really helpful obviously is a level experience and experience within the ib and quite often to have a good understanding of the ib you need to teach at an ib school so if you are thinking of teaching a, a, in a long term trajectory then getting some experience in an independent in, in a independent or international school where possible would be super, uh, super helpful otherwise there are many courses that you could self train yourself to learn the ib and initially there are two levels for the ib um, with most of the core subjects there's a standard level and the higher level if we take maths as a running example you could start with just learning standard level and sharing your expertise in that but again a lot of these top tutoring companies will want people that are experienced in standard and higher level uh, the other thing that i'm not really specialized in is 11 plus and 13 plus and 16 plus exams um, 13 plus and 16 plus i do have experience in but entrance to grammar and independent schools the market for that is absolutely huge at the moment and arguably higher than gcse i stuck to my niche and it's something i'll talk about later um, because i didn't want to spread myself too thin however if a level ib is something that's out of your comfort zone then definitely learning the ropes regarding uh, entrance exams is something that um, tutor, uh, parents will bite your hands off for and these kind of companies are really looking for people they can trust to lead students and parents and families through that process so hopefully there's a few things that you might be able to um, develop within your own learning or opportunities you might be now looking out for um, if you would like to get involved with one of these i would say a more intimate um consultancy firms or tutoring companies um, and there's quite a few and a lot of them are based in central london um, but again a lot of them will do tutoring online and just my per my personal route was through um keystone i i got accepted with a few other companies i won't mention their names out of respect um, but i found keystone by a, a country mile were, were much better uh, and i'm just about to start tutoring with another company called Quint uh, quintessential education so i'm just onboarding with them um, but they have given me access to a lot of clients and then what will normally happen is you nurture the relationship with that client um, obviously if a client has come through an agency then you need to respect that and adhere to their rules and their systems and their finances however what will happen then is that client will tell a friend and they'll come to you directly and then obviously you can um you can have a slightly different setup uh where normally you can charge a slightly higher fee so that's a little bit about agencies where possible stay away from the ones where there's 20 30 people applying for a job because it just is not worth your time um, try and find a more niched agency um, and try and upskill yourself or find an experience that will allow you to be more um, desirable for them and the third thing i didn't mention is not an agency but kind of an ad, uh, advertising platform like super prof or something like that where you can use these websites as a way of showing people information about yourself so your reviews uh, your testimonials and then a general bio and if people come through if you don't have your own website then these are great platforms Otherwise, I'd highly recommend getting your own website because it adds to your brand and your your professional your professional status as well, which are all things I'll talk about later. I am conscious I have rambled on for about ten minutes. Um, I'd be well. I'd welcome any questions that people have so far. Otherwise, I'll I'll crack on. Okay, I think everyone's good. Perfect. 
So moving forward, if you decide that this is the thing I want to do now, you'll be in one of two situations. You'll be in the first situation, which is where you're currently teaching, or you might be in a totally different field. You might have just come out of university. You might be working a corporate job, whatever it is. If you want to get involved in tutoring now, the first stage, which is a stage I'd highly recommend everyone go through, is you start tutoring alongside your job. Now, I appreciate for teachers that are already maxed out and stressed, and stressed, this can be super hard to balance. If you can balance it, I think it's very important and acts as a, a solid insurance to make sure you're not over committing and then having a financial um, a lack in terms of finances once you made the jump. And it allows you just to scope out whether or not financially this works for you. Um, so that's option one. Second option is so yeah i'll talk about option one first and that is starting in the background that's starting whilst you're doing whatever you're doing and for me starting in the background was starting whilst i was at university um so by the time i actually finished my teaching um my time in teaching i had actually been tutoring for eight years if that makes sense so starting in the background and i've put a picture of seeds here because the way i think about clients is you plant seeds and this isn't something that i found you can just advertise and get um, and also after attending the tutors conference uh, com conference last year, the, the people on the panel who, who are all doing super well with their own companies, they all echoed one thing. And that is the best thing, the best way of advertising for tutoring is word of mouth. So for me, it's getting those seeds planted as early possible. And again, for me, it is a long game. It's not a short fix. It is something that takes quite a long time to develop, um, depending on your input and your effort and the level of service you offer. So I would say if you haven't already, don't make the jump straight away unless there's a specific reason. Um, I mentioned Keystone, they actually take on full-time tutors and it's only, I think the only tutoring company in the UK that takes on full-time tutors as a job. So if you've got a full-time job, then brilliant, make the jump. However, if you think of it as a side hustle, as something in the background, definitely build that up over a few years or however long you might feel um, would allow you to give the number of clients you need that allows you to pass that stress test, the financial stress test that we mentioned a minute ago. Um, obviously, that will include two jobs at once for many of you. And just to give you my personal time frame, so I started thinking about leaving teaching seriously in January 2023. And the reason for me personally was I was at an amazing school. My work-life balance was really, really good. Um, the students were great. I loved it. However, due to, due to the fact I started at a very good school, I found it hard to be able to find another teaching job that was in the most respectful way as good and also could pay me at the same level as the independent pay scale. Uh, so the other option was, shall I develop into a head of maths or even pastoral? Pastoral was something I really didn't want to do because I loved being with students. And in terms of head of maths, um, I didn't see a job opening due to the kind of school I was at for quite a while. Um, and in all due respect, I didn't feel that the pay was worth the extra admin and hours that I'd be spending away from the classroom, which is where I didn't want to be anyways. So then at that point, I thought, right, I want to change career paths. And I was very, very close to becoming a data analyst. However, because I'd been tutoring for quite a while, my wife gave me a nudge to say, why don't you try this? And that's at the point where I started getting involved with tutoring companies like Keystone. And I actually started tutoring with Keystone in January 2023. So January 2023, um, I tutored with Keystone um, for about a year and a half before leaving teaching. And I think probably, sorry, for about six months, uh, I beg your pardon. And I think as I approached summer, um, as I approached kind of April, so about three, four months in, I realized this is actually feasible and there's a steady flow of clients coming in. So it took me about three or four months to be able to trust the the process that i had had with that agency and also i found as i'd ramped up things personally um clients were coming in and word of mouth was doing its thing but again i had seeds planted from eight years ago so i was in quite an advantageous position again you need to look at your personal situation for me um why did i want to change my daughter was on her way so i wanted a bit of time away from school um and also i could have done I could have survived with slightly less finances because I was living at home. So I had like a, an insurance on top of my insurance. Some people are more risky and they want to make a bit more of a bold step. For me, because I had a child on the way, I need to make sure that there was a sale proof. Um, and my worst case scenario was I try it for a year. And if it doesn't work, I've got five years experience in a great school. I'll go back to teaching. So 
I think there's very, for most experienced teachers, you'll find a job fairly quickly if it goes um, to pop. Um, so it's always good maybe just to give yourself a time frame, whether that's six months, a year, to try it. If it doesn't work, then you know you're going to head back. Um, set of exams, the most different have been the same year. So every year, the, almost the whole. Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, depending on what kind of air networks you're getting into, um, initially the most demand the the demand for tutoring is exam cohorts but what i've found especially with parents that are um a bit more wealthy they want support from students right from year seven just to make sure that they're staying up with the pack um and also not just wealthy parents but generally parents i think are becoming um a bit more open to this idea of general support with a level yes obviously then you're quite restricted to a two-year time frame um, however, with those A-level students, if the seeds are planted long enough, you'll have, for example, if we have Tom who's doing A-level, he does A-level with you, uh, and then Tom goes off to university. If you've given a really good service to Tom and Tom's family, quite often they will brag about you. And I've found this, and me as a parent now, if I go to a great nursery, I'm going to brag about it to everyone because I want other people to know. And what I've found in the tutoring world is the same culture exists even for bad as well so this is why it's really quite a it's quite a, a delicate thing um, if you get it right then tom's family will tell all of his cousins tell all of his friends tom's mom and dad will tell their work colleagues and then you'll get a year 12 or a year eight student that will come in through you again these are seeds that you can't follow the projection for but based on my eight years of experience i've found that they definitely do stop sprouting um the higher the level you um are in terms of the service you provide um and how well you nurture that relationship with the clients um but yeah if you're limited to a level then obviously it's a little bit more difficult and again is there demand i think asking the experts um again attending um, networking events conferences people that are running tutoring companies again the tta is a per perfect place to find these events going up to them and just honestly asking is in my in my subject is there demand for this um, and unfortunately, there are some subjects where it is very, very hard to find clients. Um, the most popular subjects, obviously, are your STEM, your maths, your sciences, English, um, economics, and you know other subjects are probably second tier, which is your history, your geography, your languages. Um, and then there are some subjects that generally don't have a lot of demand. So you need to be real about what you're teaching. If what you're teaching doesn't really have much demand, can you retrain to teach something else? If you really want to pursue tutoring that off um, that, that 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 with that much dedication. Again, I'll stop for any questions that people may have just on the last slide, which is your initial steps and how to build that transition. Obviously, it goes without saying. Once you find there's enough information for you to go off, then you know at that point you'd you'd hand your notice in. Some teachers actually find that as they become more efficient at school they free up time at school so tutoring alongside is fine and they do both just depends on what your what your intended outcomes are okay i'll crack on um so one of the biggest things as i've mentioned is attracting clients and finding a strategy and this was something over the past year so i've been tutoring full time now for a year um i've really started to hone into and has has been quite a game changer for me so i've already mentioned word of mouth um i think each tutor even though we all might be mass tutors, we'll have very different strategies. And for myself, this first year was just an exploration and a bit of a tester. And I did a bit of hybrid with one-to-one -one and group sessions, group sessions being both in, in person and online. What I found due to my access to the kind of clients that I have personally, um, a lot of them are central London based, a lot of them are independent schools, a lot of them are abroad. So they're generally quite wealthy. Um, I'm finding that the best avenue for me is to nurture a more tailored premium service which is one-to-one -one, but at a higher rate rather than trying to get three or four students in a class um and doing it that way so i think depending on your demographic what area you're in what access you have to clients what kind of agencies you work with um i know most people are now going down the group session um because it's financially a lot more viable and if you're a great tutor then tutoring five or six students um, is quite straightforward as long as they're reasonably in the same kind of ballpark in terms of ability and online if you're tech savvy um, using things like split screens um, and uh, a stylus then that can be quite easily done 
So I think finding your niche, for me personally, the one-to-one -one with a more premium approach, I offer things like 24 seven support on WhatsApp. Um, so students can send me a message anytime and I'll get back to them within 24 hours. Um, things like that allow me to give a higher, a higher package if that makes sense. So I think over the first year, open yourself up to as many things as you can without being overwhelmed and allow for a bit of experimenting. And then in the second or third year, you can think, okay, I really want to hone down in this and see how it goes. Um, the NTP will affect the demand for tutoring. Um, yes, uh, Julius, you might be able to help with this. From my understanding, they're not renewing it. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I know I, last year, I remember seeing quite a lot of jobs being offered um, at quite desirable rates from 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 schools i remember there was a school i actually went to interview at that was offering 60 pound an hour um, but obviously it's quite it's quite financially viable for them if the funding's there from my understanding it was generally schools that were in um struggling areas that had access to this um someone correct me if i'm wrong um so i think the extra support that would have been given to those students um whose families potentially couldn't offer that kind of a rate have that with that funding being reduced I'm not sure if those parents will go out of their way to now find um, tutoring options. Um, it just depends on the, the demographic, I guess. So I think it'll be an interesting development. Um, and I'm not too clued up on what kind of schools the NTP targeted. If it is generally schools that are in um, more struggling areas, then I don't think there's gonna be a huge influx of parents that have felt the hit from the NTP going away. If it's general schools with across the country, then you might see a little bit um, but hopefully that makes a bit more sense and i don't think it's something that you should definitely depend on if that if that helps find your niche this is the biggest thing that i found um i think again tutoring companies like keystone um there's bonus there's a few really really high-end tutoring companies that are looking for amazing tutors i interviewed with one another the other day as i mentioned and i was quite um upfront about what my specialism is and they asked me about 11 plus and i said i've done interviews but uh, i've written papers for 11 plus but i don't i don't really enjoy it as much so i rather focus on gcc and a level and they were actually glad that i was honest about it and they said we'd rather a tutor be 100 percent on one or two things rather than 60 percent on seven different things so i think don't be afraid to tell people what your niche is um and don't go in saying oh, i can do whatever you want because what will happen is if you give that assumption they'll give you seven different students in seven different levels and then your planning time will be ridiculous you won't enjoy it um you'll be learning on the go and the whole thing can be quite overwhelming if you're just trying to spread yourself really thin so master your area develop it and offer something unique that no one else has okay a bit more on client management agency if you already have your own treatment. yeah definitely so i have my own shooting company which is called the scholar and uh, hopefully you've seen the subconscious messages um i have my own tutoring company the scholar um where i i tutor from and i also have a few tutors working with me it's a small team now of five to six tutors um, you can still have your own tutoring company and contract for another company and what i found is um most tutoring companies know this and it, they're not scared of taking tutors on that have their own have their own business or have their own clients they're well aware of it and it's something that's widely accepted from from my experience so far with clients, I think, especially um, with any client rather, first impressions count. And this goes a very, very long way. Um, I remember going to tutoring sessions centers myself as a student um, where nothing was planned. Um, the payment was, we, we used to pay six weeks later. They didn't really chase things. And I knew when I got there as a kid, I didn't really need to work. And then I went somewhere else and there was an email sent to my mom. There was a weekly lesson report. Payment was taken up front. And that in itself, that culture made me work. And I think parents are very receptive of this and students are very receptive of this. So I would say from the get go, whenever you get in touch with a client, it needs to be 100 percent. So what does that mean for me? Um, if I get a client through Keystone, um, as long as I'm not on holiday, I'll make sure I, I contact them within 24 hours. And I will always try to contact them before they contact me because they realize, wow, this tutor is making an effort. He's really on top of things. We have confidence in him. I will always send a message and an email. Um, email just gives that level of professionalism. And in terms of an email, just small things like a signature go such a long way. This is my signature for any email I send. Best wishes. It explains who I am, director and senior master tutor for the scholar. Um, and it gives my accreditations as well. 
And a very quick win are things like the accreditations you can get from being in the tutors association. If you're a member and a client sees that, they're like, okay, he's part of a formal body. He has some level of safeguarding. He has some level of compliance. This is someone we can trust. Um, and I was very lucky enough to be awarded a finalist spot within the National Tutoring Award. So obviously that doesn't do any harm to clients. Um, so any accreditations, things like that, that you can add, um, definitely throw those in. And I feel quite often they're overlooked. But this will start to build the image that clients will have of you. And then they that as a result, they will pass on to other students, other parents, other clients. And I feel if you're very proactive, if you're professional, then a professional rate is much more reasonable because you're giving that kind of a package. If it's oh, a quick phone call or a text um, and then you don't reply for seven days and then you get back to them with a WhatsApp voice note then you're kind of demanding those kind of prices as well. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of the level you want to stay at consistently. And this can be hard. The admin can be quite overwhelming, but you want to introduce systems that make this second nature to you as well. Um, giving updates. So after any new client, after the first hour of tutoring, I, I send a voice note, a WhatsApp voice note, assuming the parents are okay with that. So that straight away they know what's happened um, and where possible, Within 24 hours, I'll try and have a phone call with them to say, this is what happened. I'm going to be honest. This is where we're at. This is what I can do. Um, do you have any questions? And I found that they really appreciate the honesty, not over exaggerating what you can do or the magic you can work. But then also saying to parents, I'm going to need you to help support Tom or whoever else it is. Um, and having that honesty from the goal set um, just gives clarity and trust within the relationship. The other thing I've started doing recently because a lot of my tutoring is virtual, is meeting clients in person. So I was in London um, about a month ago to see a friend and I just texted a few of the clients saying, I'm in central London, whatever you like to go for a coffee. And yeah, I met a few of them and we just sat down, spoke about life, spoke about tutoring, spoke about what their family's needs are. And for example, I went to go meet uh, one of the families, uh, as a, um, a student from St. Paul, St. Paul's Girls School. And after sitting down with him face to face for an hour, having a really nice conversation, he actually gave me some business advice. Um, and then he he really liked me. And he's saying, can you tutor my other two, my other two um, um, children as well? And now he's recommended me to a friend. So I feel the networking and the being a people person is, is super, super important and, and really plants those seeds at a higher rate. So definitely go and speak to parents, have a coffee, go for lunch, whatever you can. Um, those things you don't see the direct outcome of them, but they do really add to the value you can preside. And it gives trust as well. Um, I am just conscious of time and I wanna make sure there's there's uh, there's a chance for questions. So I'm gonna speed these things up. If anyone would like more details on what I'm talking about, let me know and I'll slow down. So then if you're gonna transition, how do you go through things? Um, so you can be a, troll, a sole trader or a, a limited company. Um, the difference, generally speaking, is the tax implications and how you deal with your taxes. And with a sole trader, the liability is on you for anything that goes wrong. As a limited company, you have a bit more of a barrier and a shell uh, should there be any implications or problems. Um, I currently act as a sole trader. I'm looking to transition to a limited company. Um, and I think everyone's individual situations are are unique and i remember speaking to julius and john actually who are here i think in one of the question and answer sessions um, and they gave me some brilliant strategies um, to help make things effective in terms of taxes but also to structure companies in quite a powerful way for me so i think one of the things they mentioned if i'm sure they won't mind me sharing is if i'm doing quite well in a personal name carry on doing my personal tutoring in a personal name now I've got four or five tutors that are tutoring for me, set them up in a limited company so that the limited company won't hit the tax threshold as high compared to if I was tutoring with them. Um, so there's quite effective ways of doing things and you can do things as a hybrid, but speak to the experts, speak to a, a, a tax consultant. Um, but again, many tax, uh, many accountants don't know much about tutoring because it's quite new. So TTA you guys, Julius and John, check into the Q and A sessions. I was shocked actually i went into one about two months ago and there was me and another lady so i literally got a free consultation from these guys for an hour um so definitely join in and um abuse the freedom um and as i've mentioned if you're if you're looking towards the ninety thousand ball mark with a limited company then you start need you need to start um thinking about vat implications 
And again, people that are well established in the tutoring field, they gave me a great piece of advice to say, if you are on a trajectory to get to 90,000, then start adding uh, adding VAT into your prices now um, so that you don't have to shift with clients and they're going to get annoyed with an extra 20%. If you're thinking about it three, four years, set your prices in such a way that the VAT is already accounted for. And until you hit that 90,000 threshold, you'll just have a nice lump sum that you can go on holiday with at the end of the year. Um, and find an accountant with good systems. Again, one of the systems I'm going to mention to you is Tutor Cruncher, uh, which I found to be really good. There's loads of systems that are out there. Uh, the best one I've found, and I know they work quite closely with the TTA, is Tutor Cruncher because it allows for things like split payments. And in terms of the tax implications for contracting tutors, it's quite awkward. Um, but that's a whole talk in itself, and I'm sure someone's covered it. But what I found is the current account I have, his software doesn't match up with Tutor Cruncher. So Tutor Cruncher uses Zero and FreshBooks and I think something else. Uh, my accountant uses Dext, which is a, a big pain in the backside at the moment because now I have to download everything manually and upload it to Dext. So now I'm looking to transition to a different accountant that will give me a, a, a seamless uh, integration with Tutor Cruncher. Um, so Tutor Cruncher is great if you're setting up your own company and you want to get contracted people in. Otherwise, old, old school is good as well. Google Sheets, I, I've shown you my Google Sheets as to how I manage my finances. Um, and also another thing that I can show you actually, um, in terms of other things that are good, um, is how to keep an eye on students. Because if you if you've got to the point where I have maybe around 20, 25 students that I'm trying to keep an eye on, it can be quite confusing. So I have something called a student tracker, which I'll show you um, here. And I'll just show you, for example, um, I'm trying to think of a student show you that wouldn't really mind. Okay, so here is my student tracker, and I've got a student called Oliver. Um, these are the topics, topics we're gonna focus on. Um, these are the dates of the lessons. And what I'll always do is say, what have I done? And what do I need to do in the next lesson? So next slide 15 onwards, variable appears multiple times. And what this does, it takes the thinking out from you. So generally speaking, I'll rock up to a lesson five or 10 minutes prior, check where I am, and I know the maths already, I'm good to go. And that cuts out you having to sit there half an hour before. Where was I last time? I need to try and find the slides. So just these small things I've found have made things so much more efficient for me. And generally, there's no planning in my lessons now, other, unless it's something that I haven't done in a while, or it's IB, HR, or A-level, even those, if you have the right resources, I would argue if you really want to make this efficient, you shouldn't be planning for lessons. And you need your, your, your level of skill or expertise should be at a stage where you can go in straight away and know what you're doing, know where things are, and know what students need. So yeah, a student tracker diagram, uh, Excel sheet is super helpful as well. Um, someone's asked a question, will you cover how you advertise yourself and your company? Yes, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, social media, so I have social media platforms, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram are the main ones, and I have a WhatsApp thing, a business account as well, uh, and also Google. So I'll talk about this because Eleni has mentioned it, and I'll just show you my website. Uh, uh, Scala. Okay, just bringing it up. Just give me one second. Okay, so this is my website, and one of the ways in which um, it's just loading. So one of the ways in which I advertise is um, through testimonials. So if someone approaches the website, um, they will have a chat now question that will take me straight to a WhatsApp link where they can just chat with me straight away. So I guess you wanna make the process as easy as possible. Um, the other thing is I have testimonials, which whenever there's a client that's interested, I'll send this link to them directly so they can go straight here and get that reassurance that, okay, there's other parents that have been in my situation. He's taught um, a range of schools, blah, blah, blah. So I would say having a good set of testimonials is one of the best things you can have up your sleeve to advertise. Um, once you've made that initial connection. The other thing that I can't stress enough is Google reviews. So again, make a Google um, business page. Um, so I'll show you mine. And what I've found is, so again, there's not a crazy amount on it. Even if you don't have a website, it's absolutely fine. But this allows you to collect your Google reviews and then they're there for life. It basically organizes things for you. And when people are searching you on Google, and if later you want to advertise by SEO, 
the first thing we look at is Google reviews. So now I've, I'm lucky enough to have 28 five star reviews um, and I actually send them a brief. So I say, can you mention uh, what year your, your student, the students in your son or daughter, what specification they're doing, um, why you needed tutoring and how you found the lessons and the support outside. And if you can, please mention the school as well. So make it super easy for the parents to fill this out. But at the same time, you get the detail you need to give assurance to prospective clients. Um, so again, you can check out what kind of things people have, have written for, for us and the kind of questions we ask. Um, other than that, generally speaking, um, I don't do advertising. I don't do paid ads because from the elders within this field, they've all said that it's a waste of money. And the best way is planting those seeds. However, um, there obviously is, there is um, an advantage to online um, advertising. But what I've found is you need to put quite a lot of money into it. And when I started looking into it myself, even a thousand pound, fifteen hundred pound would go just to testing a system to work out what works best for your company and the kind of niche you need. And I just didn't have I don't have that money at the moment. Um, so if you're getting to a serious level, then maybe online advertising. Otherwise, posters in local shops, um, leave your business cards in pizza shops or other places. Um, those things, you know, do bring in a bit of clientele as well. Um, all of my social media, I've outsourced. So I have a, la a lovely lady on Fiverr called Chloe from South Africa. She's great. And she actually comes up now with six posts a week, sends me a calendar and I just upload them. She creates the posts, the hashtags, everything. So rather than me trying to learn how to use Canva and create all these social media posts, which I did for a while, I make reels. At this moment in time, because things are quite stable, financially, it doesn't make sense me spending my time on that. So I'd rather pay someone else because it's more value for money for me, if that makes sense. Um, so whatever you can outsource when the finances are allow, do outsource it, um, even though it will sting initially. What that will do is it will give you time and headspace to be able to think about the development of the company and you as a tutor. Otherwise, if you're doing 20 tasks and 20 jobs, you're going to be stuck where you are. HR as well. At some point, you might want to get an admin assistant involved, whether that's part time just to reply to emails. Initially, you want to do everything yourself. You want to reply to emails. You want to make your own website. You want to make your own Instagram posts. As clients come in, you need to decide what's your role going to be within this company. And for me, it's going to be managing and teaching the highest, highest level of maths. Anything else I want to pay someone else to do eventually. Um, and Calendly is amazing in terms of organizing lessons. I remember I didn't use Calendly until about six months ago and before I literally used to get a paper and write down each client and try and like make a matrix to see which hours fit where it was a mess. Calendly is super easy. You can send it to your clients rather than going back and forth. Say, here's my link, book in via the Calendly, Calendly link, and you will get a notification via your email and it will go straight onto your calendar. Everyone's happy. You know what's going on. They get the Zoom link. Uh, Calendly is very easy to use. Um, definitely check out some YouTube videos or if you have any questions, I can give you a demo at the end. Um, so those things will just free up time um, small amounts of time, but when there's multiple things, it will free up a lot. And as clients get more, uh, as you get more and more clients, especially if you've got tutors working for you, you need every minute you can get. Um, so try and get out of the habit of doing things yourself, um, which is hard because I'm a bit of a control freak as well. <laughs> Outsourcing work. So just a little bit about tutors. Um, I would generally say try and find people that you know personally to start with. Because whilst your company is in its infancy, you need tutors that will really defend your corner and offer a super, super high level of service because they are acting on your name. So the six tutors I currently use, four of them I know personally, they're either friends or ex-colleagues. Um, two of them are people that I've interviewed thoroughly. And I was in like three interviews, a prep lesson, I've checked their DBS, I've checked whether or not their degree certificate is a fake or real, all those kind of things. Um, Again, I, I'm going to leave this now because it's quite a big topic. Setting clear expectations. So I said to the, all of my tutors, I expect you to um, have a 24-7 support WhatsApp line because that's what I offer. I expect you to update a student tracker. So I'll make a student tracker for them. So if there are any problems or a parent has said, oh, I'm unhappy with this, I can go in and see what's been taught that lesson. Um, so that's really important that you set clear expectations for them before they come on. And if you're asking them to do extra work, like for me, the WhatsApp 
outside of lessons is extra i give them a higher rate because i'm expecting them to give a higher a high level of of service um, and also what value are you adding for them because otherwise quite frankly why would they not just take your clients and go independent and give the client a cheaper rate and they earn more money themselves i think um you need to make sure they feel appreciated and look after them well um how do i look after them i give them access to uh, zoom packages um things like save my exams that we pay for as a company they'll have access to which they can use for their own personal clients as well any tutors that are new into the field um i actually give them a training session as to how to run a lesson and also i automate all of their billing and admin via tutor country now so the whatever your percentage is whether it's 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent of the fee that you charge for them for them it's actually helpful and they in a way are paying you to bring clients in but do their admin as well so you need to add some value to them otherwise if you're just introducing a client to them and taking money off them um, every week at some point they're going to lose faith um as a soldier daytime yeah good question I'll, I'll answer these at the end if that's okay thank you they're good questions and feel free to keep sending them through uh, make things sustainable as i've mentioned um collect reviews this one is super helpful if you're applying for jobs as a consultant or if you're applying for a new tutor and company generally make a google, google drive whenever you submit a biography or what um uh, like a, a, a cover letter save it in a google drive because then you can just copy and paste it every time don't make life complicated for yourself any um, tutoring jobs you apply for make sure you saved all of that hard work because then for example if i apply for a a level job um privately i, I apply for an a level job through the uh, an agency i just copy and paste change the school name change the exam board because the skills are the same so make life efficient for yourself i've already talked about client student spreadsheets student trackers we've already covered and again this might be controversial but um i would argue if you really want to expand you shouldn't be planning lessons much that doesn't mean you're lazy that just means your level of teaching has got to such a good level where you know the specification inside out you know where your resources are they're easily accessible all you need to do is 10 minutes prior five minutes prior check where you picked up off from last lesson and go straight into the lesson otherwise there aren't enough hours in the day um and i'm quite lucky enough because i've had five years of full-time teaching i can do that with the, the courses i teach however for 11 plus i wouldn't be able to I'd need to prepare to be able to deliver a lesson to a high level. That's why I don't do it. And again, don't spread yourself too thin. Focus on your niche. We're just finishing off. Um, a few tips. Learn from the experts. There have been people, there are people, I'm a person that has made the mistakes that you might already, you, you might encounter. And by speaking to people that are experts in the field, I actually saved six months of work or a year's work of work because I just listen to them and learn from their mistakes. So try and I, I would argue annoy as many people as you can with questions, um, especially at events like the tutors conference or even the local reg regional networking events or even things like this online. Um, ask, ask as many questions as you can because I guarantee you it will save you time somewhere. And don't be afraid to share your expertise. I've only been tutoring full time for a year, but I'm quite confident to get out there and share whatever I know. And I was fortunate enough to actually speak at the tutors conference last year. And what that did for me was because I, I was a speaker and I shared the, the value I had to share, which wasn't a lot, but whatever it was, it was good and people enjoyed it. I actually made a good network. People followed me on LinkedIn. I met um, new connections from the tutors association conference. And, and that in itself gave me a support system around me. So put yourself out there um, in the Q and A's, ask questions again at the tutors conference. Um, I was the first one to ask a question um, and two of the panelists actually came up to me after because they really liked the question. And they said, you know what, how can we help you more? What I'll find in the tutoring field, especially those that are members of the TTA, everyone wants everyone to win. There is plenty to go around and people are more than happy to share their, their lessons and, and help you, um, overcome any obstacles try and get constant feedback from parents a agencies like for example i work with keystone tutors the client managers i'll always ask them how are clients finding with me and now they've got into a habit of whenever they get feedback from a client they just forward it me straight away because they know i want to know um, whether it's good or bad um, students and find out from other tutors check in if you're unsure about something ask but even if you're not unsure about things 
just share what you're doing with other um, tutors and they say actually you could do it this way you could do it that way put yourself out there and and don't be private the last thing i've I really come to learn especially with trying to charge higher rates is your time and expertise is only as valuable as you make it out to be that you could be an oxford graduate in your degree but if you're not confident in what you can deliver someone will pay you 15 pounds an hour however you can have a degree from a not so great university but be amazing at what you do really know your things inside out um, have a great track record and be confident in what you can deliver and charge 100 pounds an hour so I think the perception you give yourself is really important because as a result, people will determine your value. And I think quite often tutors do underestimate themselves because they're desperate to get clients in. And I appreciate in the transitional period initially, you will need to do that. But once you're stable or once you feel, you know, what, I do have value to add, then don't undersell yourself. And this has been really hard for me, um, especially with the business side of things where, for example, if my if my fee, for example, is 50 pounds an hour, for one of the tutors that we have with us if someone comes to me and says i can only afford 40 pounds an hour but i really want to go with you six months ago mandy would have said okay i'll make this work and I'll, I'll i'll try and negotiate my tutor down and i'll try and take a bit of a hit just to get the client in i realized in the long term that's more detrimental because then that client would tell someone else 40 pounds and then your tutor will be unhappy because you're paying him a, a paying him or her a lower rate so now the mandy will say look i'm afraid we can't budge I have to pay my tutors um, this is the reason we charge this because of the premium service we offer if you'd like it great if not um, here's a few of the tutors you can try and try and help them out sticking to that is very hard um, but I'm in a position where I have enough clients at the moment where I can do that um, however I appreciate there is a transition whenever you get to that comfortable stage hold your horses hold your guns and know what your worth is um, Julius I'm just conscious of time and I don't want to keep people longer than we need to um, are we okay to wrap things up in about five, ten minutes? Yeah, of yeah, course, cool. yeah. If you um, just want to finish up with your presentation, Mandy, uh, whenever you are ready, and then there's a couple of questions you can go through as well. Well, to be honest, that's, actually, that's, that's oh. me then. Um, so there's a few questions, and feel free, feel free to put your cameras on or even just um, unmute yourselves. Um, so, yeah, Daniela, definitely check out some YouTube tutorials. YouTube is uh, <laughs> it's like it is my go to for anything. Um, someone's made a tutorial for everything on YouTube. So I definitely watched one on Calendly and it saved me a lot of time. Uh, Susan's asked, as a sole trader who is no longer teaching at a school, is there demand for tutoring in the daytime? Great question. Predominantly, things are weekends or evenings. Again, as your seeds start to sprout, what I've found is if you can find students in a different country, like I have quite a few students in Hong Kong at the moment um, and a few in America. So you might be able to work with time difference. However, the main thing I found works is any A-level students or students that are in sixth form, I'll try and push to get a session in their free periods, which doesn't always work. Um, and you need the buy-in from the parents and sometimes the school as well. But I've got maybe two or three students that I do within the day which just eases off and it means that I can have one evening off kind of thing. So the biggest answer for that, I would say, is sixth form students and try and get them in a free period if school allows. Thank you. No worries. Um, I think, yeah, for online lessons, I'm using Zoom. Uh, I find Zoom's really easy. And I have I have three monitors, basically. So I use a Microsoft Surface, which allow, I can take off the keyboard for and use a stylus. So that's my... That's my notepad, if you like. Um, I then have another screen where I can just research things and screen grab questions in. I have a third screen that actually I present my PowerPoint to and share my screen to, if that makes sense. So two are used for PowerPoint. One's for what the student sees, one's for my PowerPoint where I can annotate. Second one is, um, the second one is for just researching or like I might need to go into a WhatsApp chat to check homework or whatever. Um, yes, generally speaking, um, it's always good to ask schools permissions um, for uses of logos or any logos of that matter. So where, where, where required, definitely try and ask. Yeah, on that actually, I actually use a school's logo um, and they actually emailed me saying we'd prefer you not to, so I had to take it down. Um, so yeah, always, always ask where possible. Perfect, thanks Mandeep. Um, does anyone have any final questions um, whilst we have Mandeep? Uh, on the presentation or if not did you want to drop your email address yeah, in your sure. box as well or there as well 
yeah so what i'll do is i'll copy and paste these things into the box yeah um and again the other thing that i didn't really mention but it's quite an easy win is if you are finding you're getting quite a lot of uh, clients come through definitely set up a separate number um because otherwise it takes over your personal life and it can be quite overwhelming so a quick pay as you go sim card or a monthly sim card for five pound ten ten pound a month with an old phone um, and also you can create a whatsapp business line and that just gives such a level of professionalism um like all of the things i've just sent i've i've got up here uh people will see on my whatsapp message so if they get my number they see this they're going to my linkedin they're going to my website and they're like okay this guy's serious he's professional blah 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 uh, and that just helps build your brand before they even pick up the phone to you if that makes sense so yeah separate that as early as you can well, that's a great tip mandy thanks um, I think that's all there is for questions right now. So I'll start off by saying a massive thanks to Mandeep for the great session. Really interesting, I'm sure. Well, I think people got some great value from it, especially those who are um, very engaged with the questions. And you can tell that obviously it was really valuable because there was lots of questions coming out throughout the session. If anyone's watching this back on a re repeat on YouTube, please feel free to get in contact with Mandeep. You can see his contact details in the presentation there and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer some questions. And for those of you who um, are planning to join some of the rest of the summer sessions, we finish up next Thursday, so please check the calendar and the schedule and try and find uh, a session that suits you. So thank you very much, everyone. I'll leave it there, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.